This is Joy News, independent, fearless, and credible. It's Thursday from our studios here in Accra and around the world. Good afternoon and welcome to The Pulse. And this afternoon, four prices break loose with prices increasing twice in just 24 hours to reach more than 14 cities a litre. And of course, surging global crude prices, depreciating CD, and the government's unwillingness to cut taxes on the product have been blamed. But how does the situation affect the economy, with transport operators demanding an immediate increase in transport fares? Also this afternoon is a government program to distribute tablets, computers to senior high school students employed to buy their votes. Former President John Mahama and the NDC believe that is government's secret plan. funding in our educational system than, than, than those laptops. But it's a bribe for them to vote for this government. But, I mean, the children do not exist in isolation. But is there any truth in this allegation or examine the truth or otherwise of this claim? And later, we speak exclusively to the Executive Secretary of the Ghana Scholarship Secretariat, as he responds to allegations of unfair distribution of scholarships to undeserving persons, including the rich and powerful. And I asked, that is this thing that needy by brilliant, needy by brilliant, who is a needy person? How do you guys assess who a needy person is? Do you use some kind of Buddhism to, <laughs> to, 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 you know, uh, ascertain this thing? We also have America Decides later on the show. The pause is brought to you by Global Community Zigilu, affordable, safe sanitation for all. We are live on DSTV channel 421 and GoTV 125. Also on our social media handles, Facebook, X and YouTube, as well as manjoonline.com. You can follow us for these and more. My name is Elton Drobe. We shall be right back to deal with the matter this Thursday afternoon. This is a pause here on Joy News. We are live around the world at myjoyonline.com on our YouTube and Facebook pages. You can join us with your comments and questions on the matters we are dealing with this afternoon. Now let's start from the political front. And elections are just, elections just around the corner. Former President John Mahama has described as vote buying the distribution of tablets to senior high school students. Government last month launched the program that will make the computer available to over 1 million students in age to aid them in, to aid in the teaching and learning. Addressing the students' forum at the Wisconsin University College here in Accra, the former president said, who is also the NDC flag bearer in the December 7 election, is convinced that gesture will influence the votes of the beneficiaries. He spoke on this and other issues, he says, are of national concern. Um, misguided policy, um, yes, and he mentioned uh, one. You bring a new curriculum, the children have no textbooks in basic school for the last four years, and you think that giving pre-tertiary students laptops, uh, uh, tablets, is more important. Of course, everybody knows the political expediency. The pre-tertiary students are going to register in May, because they will, some of them would be coming 18 years and above, some are 18 already, and they are going to be the ones voting. So this is a gift to entice them to vote for the, uh, the current government. Otherwise, if you are using 1.3 billion cities to give pre-tertiary students laptop, our priority would have been different. There are other things begging for funding in our educational system than, than, than those laptops. But it's a bribe for them to vote for this government. But, I mean, the children do not exist in isolation. They live in households and families. Some of them, parents, are those who were working in the banking sector that you cruelly closed nine indigenous banks and threw them all out onto the street. Bankers have become Uber drivers. Those are the same people whose children are in pre-tertiary education. So you think if you give a child a tablet, the child will vote for you. 
after what you have done to their parents, most of those children go home and their parents struggle to put a meal on the table for them because of your poor mismanagement of this economy. And you think that just giving the child a tablet is enough to buy their conscience to vote for you? I don't think so. The children should take the tablet, but they should remember that we cannot stand another four years of this poor driver Banza and his driver's mate. Yeah. So the former president also spoke about the scholarship secretariat and how some unde undeserving Ghanaians are benefiting to the detriment of the needy in the society. The basic principle that underlies scholarships is that one, the course the student is going to do is not available in Ghana. Or it is a priority course where we do not have enough capacity to train students. And so those are the principles that we look at. I mean, if you want to do an MBA, there are so many schools doing MBA in, in Ghana today. Why should somebody go abroad to go and do an MBA and be paid for by Ghanaian taxpayers' money? If you want to go and do a Harvard MBA, for heaven's sake, pay for it yourself. And so we must stick by the rules and regulations for which scholarships are awarded. For instance, in our time, we gave a lot of scholarships to go to Scotland. Many Ghanaian students went to Scotland because we had started the beginning of oil production. And we did not have enough expertise in oil production. And so in the four years that I was in office, actually in the eight years from Professor Mills' time, we skewed a lot of the scholarships to students who were going to stay at, at, at learn petroleum sector, oil management, accounting, uh, oil sector law, and so on and so forth. And there are many students who got those scholarships and are back here in Ghana and working. And so we must draw the lines. We must have a minister like Nana Jenopokwa Jima who will make sure, who will make sure that the scholarships we are being given are for scholarships that are relevant to the human resource development of this country. And again, the scholarships must go to underprivileged people, young people who come from backgrounds that do not have the capacity to sponsor them. And so again, the social construct of the person's origin should be taken before a scholarship is given. I mean, there are many of us who can afford to pay the fees of our children if we decide that they should go to university abroad. And so we have no business going to the scholarship secretariat and asking for scholarships for our children. And so we will have a person superintending the scholarship secretariat that will make sure that the guidelines are implemented and that those getting the scholarships are deserving of those scholarships. So these are the matters brought forward by the former president, who's also the NDC's flag bearer for the December 7th elections. And one of the issues that you spoke about early on was the provision of tablet for uh, senior high school students. That is one government policy that <clears throat> is already underway. Now, we'll, we'll get some response from the education ministry, but let me try and understand exactly what the former president is trying to communicate this afternoon. Uh, Mustafa Gbande is Deputy General Secretary of the NDC. He joins me via Zoom. Mustafa, good afternoon and welcome. And Mustafa, if you can kindly unmute for me so we can hear you and have a very sound conversation. Hello. Yes, Mustafa, it's good to have you here I, on the I, 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 I think I've won. Yes, Hello. Yes, and, I, and I'm saying it's good Hello. to have you here on the post. Mustafa, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Good to have you too. Right. So, uh, two key issues that came up at the Students Forum yesterday. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. I said two issues that came up strongly after the forum with the Wisconsin University College students first had to do with the government decision to distribute tablet to all senior high school students. That uh, event, the launch was last, uh, last month. The former president is of the firm belief that this is clearly another way government is seeking to buy votes of people who are likely to turn 18 and above and will be eligible to vote in the upcoming election. 
why should tablet that will aid teaching and learning be now taken on the platform of politics? Yes, it appears that we are... We, we, well, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now, Mustafa. Yes. Did you hear my question? Yeah. Yes, I heard your question. Uh, it is very clear now that uh, under the president's or the government's own policy of three senior high schools, today, if you go beyond the uh, capitals, one would have expected that we focus on teaching ICT basics mm. so that these students can have uh, a better use for these tablets. So beyond the regional capitals, uh, from the village I come from, uh, it's hardly for a student to be able to understand the full functions of these tablets. Mm. And so of what benefit is it going to be to a student that is not equipped with the fundamentals to understand the use of these tablets? Now, in their own policy of, you know, chaining out a lot of students, they are sharing scholarships that will help poor but needy students who are beneficiaries of their own free senior high schools so that they can upgrade. Those scholarships are given to children of ministers, Freddie Billy. Those scholarships are given to uh, uh, ministers, Adjoa Safo. Those scholarships are given to uh, uh, CEOs of national service. And you ask yourself, so after free senior high school, after distributing tablet, what is the, you know, the progression of these students? And what is the quality of training that they have received in terms of teaching and learning so that they can put into good use? But, 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 this government has been in power for the last seven good years. Like and they rolled out this. Hello? Yes, Mustafa, I, I was just going to. So if we can exhaust the tablet first and then we can move to the scholarship. The, the they have said that they've, they've rolled out, they've rolled out their free senior high school policy in the last seven years or six years. Mm. So how come they couldn't, you know, bring these tablets for the students only to wait seven months to their exit in, in government? They are now going to share tablets for students. Clearly, it's a game plan to deceive the students. But I do know that if you look at the component of their own policy as we have today, poor quality of feeding structure, Stakeholders of the free senior high school policies are complaining, teachers are complaining, headmasters are complaining, that students themselves are not getting proper teaching processes. And so all of these are going to be prioritized going into the 2024 election other than just the rhetorics of sharing tablets. Because let beyond me the rhetorics, let, let, let the students don't understand to, the use of the tablet. Right. Most of all, allow me here. So the, the, the former president, argument is that this could influence the, 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 the choice of the uh, students, those who turn 18 uh, will be eligible to vote in the December elections. I remember that during the NDC time, you also made some distribution of some computers. Was it also done to influence the votes of, of, of students and beneficiaries? We, we, didn't, we, we didn't wait to distribute these laptops or these tablets seven months to the end of the term of the government. Does it really matter? Really wait. The, it does it really matter that there are some students who are already in SS1? There are yes, more students. Matters. Yes, it I was, it's, I was saying that doesn't it, matter because if you go to the SS system, there are those in it, SS1, it matters SS2. because when they were... SS1 and SS2 students will not be eligible to vote in the upcoming election. How do you put all of them under the super politics and say that it is meant to you know, influence their choice of vote? Well, we appear to be having no, But I'm answering your question that you said at our time we also gave tablets. So the difference is that we didn't wait. Oh. Hello? Yes, Mustafa, it appears your connection is a challenge this afternoon. Let me shift to the public relations officer with the Ghana Education Service. 
Mr. Kwesi Kwarteng to get his reaction to this matter. Mr. Kwarteng, you're welcome to the polls. Okay, uh, thank you very much, my brother, and a very good afternoon to you and your viewers. So a simple question will be, was this tablet distribution done so that you'll be able to garner so, uh, support and votes from those who, will be, those who will turn 18 and will be eligible to vote in the December 7th election? Was that really the rationale behind the distribution? Uh, well, I mean, I will waive the uh, invitation to uh, play politics with uh, everything, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, education sector. I feel that education is so sensitive. sensitive. Uh, all over the world, there is a strong link between education and socioeconomic transformation, and not just any other education, but an education that is aligned uh, to what pertains within the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. If you recall, in the first industrial revolution, during the development of steam and steam engines, Africa and Ghana as a country, we did not take part. During the second industrial revolution, uh, the, the invention of electricity, were also at the consuming end. Mm. The third industrial revolution brought about computers and what have you. Africa as a continent, we did not take active part in it. Now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. All over the world, people are repositioning their education system. People are realigning the education system. So for us in the Ministry of Education, our point is that we have to understand the need. We have to understand that currently there is a need to uh, uh, understand, that, understand the changing dynamics of uh, education in the global setting. Mm. So that within the context of education, having an impact on the socioeconomic transformation, we have to understand that every country all over the world, they are shifting and they are repositioning and realigning the education. And what is education that they are providing? They are not just providing just education or any other education, but an education uh, that is uh, anchored on, on digitalization, an education that is relevant within the fourth industrial evolution mm. space. And so for us in the Ministry of Education, we feel that it is even long overdue that uh, uh, whilst, I mean, just 2021, we started with the distribution of the one teacher, one uh, uh, laptops, which of course 2021 was not election year, we felt that it was also necessary that if the whole world is migrating, if the whole world is realigning, if the whole world is uh, repositioning in order to produce, uh, I mean, critical mass of students who are assertive, who are problem solvers, who, who are critical thinkers, we also have to reposition ourselves. So for, for the NDC, I mean, it's a political group. For Mr. Mahama, he is a politician. I mean, he, he, I mean it is left for him to uh, place political interpretations on some of these government interventions. But for us in the Ministry of Education, our understanding, as far as we are concerned, the nation's whole understanding is that this is an opportunity for us to reposition Ghana's education so that we will not be left behind and provide our children with the needed resources. Of course, I mean, clearly, if you look at the argument that has been advanced, logically, it is not consistent. When you started your distribution of RLG laptops in 2012, I mean, was that to Ghana, uh, I mean, political votes? If you look at first years who are in school, a lot of them are 14, 15 years. They are not even eligible to vote. Mm. But you are having a government distribution, uh, distributing uh, tablets to uh, all the 1.3 million students in school, which even practically, even if you are to do the arithmetic, about 20, 30% to be eligible to vote. That is even if they want to vote. So you you don't get where this whole logic is coming from. That so, so as a will say that, so, intervention, so, so, one who want to place political mm -hmm. interpretation on it. Mr. Kwarten, for, for, the, for, for that category of students that you mentioned, SS1 and SS2, who may be 14, 13, 15, they may not be eligible to vote in the 2024 uh, election. But some will say that this is just an attempt to cultivate new voters ahead of future elections. The NDC's concern is about the timing. So, so why should Ghanaian students be denied access of the uh, relevant technological equipment and deployments, especially within a crucial time like this, where the whole world is talking about digitalization, just on the basis that, I mean, a political party is not convinced uh, that the motive behind the sharing of the 
of the of the tablets. Mm. Why should ordinary Ghanaian students suffer? Why should ordinary Ghanaian children uh, uh, suffer and be denied access to what the rest of the world, their counterparts are having in the rest of the world, just because we have an election in 2024? I I think I think that yes, politics. Uh, I mean I mean largely has an impact on uh, socioeconomic transformation and everything. But I mean, sometimes let's be firm, let's stand up to the occasion and let the whole world know that it is not everything that we have to play politics with it, particularly education. We have allowed ourselves and destroyed every gains that we've took as a country with the politicization and extreme politicization of issues. Today, today, every topic that you raise, if you talk about national health insurance, it's politicized. If you talk about uh, 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 taxation, it's politicized. If you talk about the strength of our city, it is politicized. If you talk about industrialization, it's politicized. I'm not sure we, are, we will be happy to watch us extend that uh, market invitation to the field of education and almost politicize everything and look into the faces of our children and say that because we have an election in seven, eight months time, if you should have access to technological deployment, and adapt to the growing and changing dynamics and the changing trends of technology all over the world. We should deny you just on the basis that uh, a politician and uh, I mean a politically exposed person feels that uh, he stands a chance of being threatened. Okay. I mean, social civil society organization, well-meaning Ghanaians, everybody should stand up and condemn uh, this deliberate politicization of everything that uh, we are doing, particularly when it it relates to the field of education. We must not destroy the every fabric, every sector of the economy just on the basis of somebody's political interest. If, if when you were saying that was not political, right. but when a government which started the distribution of teacher tablets in 2021, of course, had a foundation, laid a foundation, and based on that foundation, is progressing to introduce what we call smart schools in the fourth industrial revolution. I mean, with hindsight that as a country, we've made first, second, third, and industrial revolution, you get the politically exposed person saying that it's for, poli it's for political gains. So what is he asserting? That we should collect all the tablets back or we should end the distribution because we have an election. After the election, we say, I don't think everything should be premised on election. No. Can you hold, can you, can you hold it for me, Mr. Quartin? Mr. Van are you back on the line? Yeah, I, I'm here. All right. So, so I mean, but my concern really, shouldn't, shouldn't the NDC and Mr. Jomahama be more interested in saying that when we come, we'll, we'll expand this distribution to cover every Ghanaian student instead of making it a political you know, issue. Yeah, so thank you very much. Let, let me place it on the record, a very quick record that Chrissy Quaxin is a baked, cooked, and roasted MPP fanatics. So let him not sit there as a PRO and pretend that he's not a politician. He Let's is look a at politician. the substance of the matter that he's talking he's, about. He's MPP. He's MPP. So let us let us set. He's a politician. He's MPP. He is within this government. Now let us go to the technical issues. I ask the whether technical what, issues. I ask whether your concern shouldn't be about making it available to every every, every Ghanaian student. If in the event that you have power, rather than politicizing those who benefited from it. Everything is politicized, including finding a woman in Ghana today. Dr. Baumia is in churches. Ask him that did they roll out any curriculum to teach or to train the teachers who are going to be handling these students in ICT? Have they retrained these teachers to make sure that even though the students have not had a curriculum that builds them up for days, the teachers are able to do so? Are they able to do that? So we cannot just get up and begin to procure you know, laptops, uh, iPads, and be sharing to students because it is taxpayers' money. The same way they mismanaged the free senior high school policy. Today, if you go to the Minister of Education, the Minister of Education, Dr. Educhum, is doing free uh, feeding himself whilst the buffer stock is doing parts. Is that how to roll out a policy? That is mismanagement. I ask you. And so when we are talking about this, he says he's not a politician. But I said, oh, when we were distributing RLG laptop, when they came to power, did they continue to introduce to distribute those laptops at the time they came back? When they came back in 2016, did President Akufado continue to distribute what RLG was distributing to the students? Didn't they stop? Didn't they stop? 
Why do you wait seven months? You exit government, then you say that I'm going to share uh, free iPads to students. When, of course, you don't have any curriculum that have trained the students on how to use these gadgets. You don't have any curriculum that have trained, in fact, the trainer the, of trainees, the teachers who are going to be handling these students. Government have not rolled out any training for the teachers country. Right? Go and talk to the, the leadership of the teachers. They will tell you. When they introduce Lancenza exams, is ICT part of their, their, their Lancenza exams? Let's to talk of having an overhaul training in ICT for these teachers and then talk about the student. And so it is not about politics. Mm. It's about the fact that this government is just deficient of ideas and do not know how to initiate a policy that will benefit the people of Ghana. You, you don't see this as benefiting the student and preparing them to be proactive in terms of the usage of the gadget to be, to be aligned with what pertains in other worlds? What is the use of a mobile phone to you if you cannot use a mobile phone? What would you use it for? If you give my brother who is in the village a, a, an iPad and he doesn't know how to use the iPad, even in internet, are they going to assess internet? I hear that they say they are putting books on it. Yes. How are they going to restrict the usage of these iPads? Clearly, we need to have a broader conversation to get the stakeholders, at least the teachers, well equipped and prepared to be able to take the students into this world. When you go to the PRO sits there and says, oh, they're in advanced country. When you go to advanced countries, do they share laptops to students? Do they share for, iPads to students? I know for Your example, duty as a Minister of Education is to train the students and equip them for the future. Even your own free senior highs policy is deficient and dead. It's a very shady policy we have implemented. Then you are sitting here and talking about the fact that uh, we are going to uh, a technological world. The person doesn't have the fundamentals. How can he go into the specialization? Let me allow Mr. Kwasi Kwati and if he has any response to the concerns that you are raising. I do understand that at the launch, the, 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 the claim was that teachers, uh, they have already been trained and there are people also training the students on the usage, the, the textbook that you spoke about, or embedded uh, in or on, the, or on this tablet. So all these informations were provided. But Mr. Kwati, if you have a response, I'm sure... Uh, I mean, uh, of course, I, I do not run away from the fact that I am politically aligned, uh, but it does not still change the fact of the argument that I'm putting forward. Politics does not mean that we lose our conscience. And for that matter, if I'm politically exposed, I do not know that my child is eligible. Uh, to assess technological de deployment and technological uh, gadgets, particularly within the fourth industrial evolution. Mm. I mean, let's be very honest to ourselves. Even beyond the distribution of one teacher, one laptop, one student, one tablet, in our own homes, those who are able to afford, don't we in many ways even afford these technological uh, products and, and gadgets for our children, of course, in a way to be able to be uh, tech savvy and uh, fit within the global trends of digitalization. So why is it that when it becomes a national policy and we feel that the whole country, everybody should get, irrespective of your financial background, we, we, we provide a level playing ground for everyone to have it, have access to it, that becomes a problem. Or because somebody is intimidated that maybe some way, somehow, is going to sway those uh, uh, among some uh, group. You see, I have a news for you. Mm. And the news is that it is not even only at the senior high school level that smart schools has been implemented or project has been implemented. In the subsequent weeks, and of course in the coming weeks, the Ministry of Education, again, is going to launch a very mega initiative about also STEM classrooms. That is technological deployment at the basic schools level. For those in class one, for those in class two, are you not aware that if you go to Kabenya today, the KG there, the KG that the newly built KG that the Ministry of Education and the government of Ghana put there, that we are piloting all over the country, 
they are all equipped with smart uh, facilities. Are the KG students also going to vote? So you see, that is why I'm saying that let us be slow. Let us not be excessively hasty in running down every government policy just because some way, somehow, it may fetch political advantage to somebody. I mean, we need to have a, have a very strong and clear balance and try to distinguish the politics of the day from very sensitive national issues. Mm. I mean, so the fact that, I mean, Kwesi Kwati is politically exposed, but you, as even as a moderator of the event, you are politically exposed. Certainly, you'll be partisan. Among the two leading political parties, you vote. Does it mean that you've lost your conscience when it comes to matters of this? Does it mean that today, when the government provides tablet for your child in Pesek, you reject the tablet and throw it away just because you feel that it's seven months to elections? I am saying that within the fourth industrial evolution, mm. the whole world is changing. And Mr. Mahama and the NDC needs to understand the changing trends of education in the global dynamics. Today, we are not training students just to read and write alone. We are not training students just to, I mean, memorize and chew and pour. Mm. We are training students who are assertive, who are critical thinkers, who are problem solvers, and who, at the end of the day, the kind of education that they will have, will have an impact on our socioeconomic transformation. So how do we have an impact on our socioeconomic transformation when the order of the day which is the digitalization, you are not taking advantage of it. So when the digitalization was also introduced at the port, everybody in the port, does it necessarily mean that everybody in the port is going to vote for the MPP? I mean, clearly no. When the, 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 the vice president, of course, led an initiative and we all introduced the Ghana card, does it mean that every Ghanaian is going to vote for mm. MPP? So we need, to, we need to elevate the conversation. We need to, I mean, I benchmark the conversation in, in a way that is very holistic and not necessarily play politics with everything. Of is course, what? as NDC as a political mm. party and Mr. Mahama, I understand that. But like I rightly indicated, it is left for them to place political interpretation on any national policy. Maybe some way, somehow, they should have also, I mean, uh, 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 brought about such policies which probably would have received such criticisms. Uh, Mr. Martin, just a quick one before, before perhaps we wrap up on this conversation. Mr. Mama also spoke about the, the scholarship secretariat and they claim that they are, they, they are granting scholarship to politically exposed individuals, individuals according to whom are capable of funding their own education. And that has been done to the detriment of the needy in, in the society. I don't know whether you have a response to this as well. Well, I mean, uh, on the face value, I, uh, the Solar Secretariat is not under the Ministry of Education. But I, I just, honestly, I just believe that to be able to, uh, I mean, give a very fair assessment and mm. comments or opinions on this, I, I have it, is important, it is important I, that I, we have the whole... So I, I'm getting feedbacks. Yes, I will, it is important we'll that we get the whole yes. list of beneficiaries. Because, I, I mean, to, to just select about 10 people and round commentary over it. Yes, I mean, you may have a point, but it's also fair that if there are 5,000 beneficiaries, mm. we get to know all of them, then we'll be able to make a very informed uh, decision and comments. Other than that, I feel that about five, 10 names, that is not so much of, uh, a, a, I mean, a sample that is fairly representative enough for anybody to, I mean, make conclusions on that. I thank you very much for your time. Let me give, we will have, we have, we have a response from the scholarship secretariat on this developing matter. But let me allow Mr. Mustafa Bande the, the final words on this matter. So, so my friend Kwesi Kwati is a politician. He, I just there, there, there is no doubt about it. You contested parliamentary primaries. No, no, he contested Akim or Asante Akim uh, parliamentary primaries and lost. So let us situate the contest. Absolutely, he's not right now. away from that. Okay, so let's uh, 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 going forward. Uh, even when you check schools that have ICT lab, there's no computer there. Even if you have, the computers are not functioning. So we beg government, they are still in power. They should focus on equipping the ICT labs that are not functioning in our schools mm -hmm. so that our kids can be taught at least with the basics of ICT. But this uh, uh, laptop or uh, uh, iPad project is clearly a political project agenda to buy votes, but it will be rejected by the people of this country. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Fagbande is a Deputy General Secretary of the NDC. And of course, remember that 
uh, the issue of scholarship and the granting of scholarship to individuals. The fourth of states uh, did some investigation on it, and it came to light that some politically exposed individuals were awarded scholarship. Now, there's been a response from the scholarship secretariats on this uh, matter, and we will bring you uh, that conversation uh, from the scholarship secretariat, the executive secretary, reacting to the, the news reportage that summed up that some politically exposed individuals, including some uh, the, the, the former chairman of the MPP, Freddie Blay, a former IGP, and other people, and their children benefited from scholarship. The flag bearer of the NDC, John Mahama, thinks that it is not right because such you know, awards should go to very deserving Ghanaians and not uh, politically exposed individuals, individuals who are capable of funding their education. This is the pause here on Join Us. We'll bring you that conversation with the Executive Secretary of the Scholarship Secretariat uh, shortly. But let's talk about another matter that is, you know, creating some uneasiness in the Ghanaian society. Now, fuel prices have inched up this morning, roughly 24 hours after an increment on Wednesday, sparking concerns. Fuel prices may be breaking chains and spiral out of control. The state oil company is today selling a liter of diesel at 14 Ghana City, 74 Pes West whilst uh, super or petrol is going for 14 cities, 15 pesos. This morning's increment is in direct response to the MPS U10 on the removal of the price stabilization and recovery levy on the price buildup of petroleum products. Here's what we know so far. So the MPA will set and communicate price flaws for the deregulated products for each pricing window and from the 1st to the 15th of each month, and then the 16th to the 30th of each month as well. And of course, petroleum service providers, the PSPS, shall no longer, under the new rules put forward by the MPA, submit indicative S refinery and S pump prices to the National Petroleum Authority. And of course, X refinery price, that's the FOB price, uh, we have the, the, those who supply their premium. They also have ex pump price, ex refinery price, taxes, levies. There's also a margin that comes with it as well. And so for the PSPS, shall also determine prices of gasoline, petrol, gas oil, liquefied petroleum uh, gas, that's LPG, gas oil, low carb, kerosene, marine, independently using the prescribed petroleum pricing formula. So oil marketing companies could be fined from between 5,000 to 20,000 Ghana cities if they do not comply with the MPA directive. And so effective April 4th, that's uh, today, uh, 16 petrol, diesel 14, LPG uh, 14 as well. Those are the upward price adjustment that we have witnessed today. So this singular decision is imparting prices heavily, prompting consumers to question government objective for the U10 on the suspension of that tax. And this afternoon we have some response for you. Uh, I also be, we have an, uh, uh, an, uh, the MPA is in the studio to tell us more about this. But let me first bring in Mr. Dan Kanamwa. Uh, he is a watcher of this industry. So Mr. Kanamwa, two issues. I mean, yesterday <laughs> I. I closed from work, I was, I was on my way home, I decided to buy fuel. When I checked from the, from, from the pump I was buying, uh, petrol was selling at 13 Ghana cities, 99 pesos. Now, this morning on my way back, I realized that there's been uh, an upward increment. Now it's gone to 14 point something. What really is happening from where you sit as an executive director for the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers? Thank you very much. Good afternoon to your viewers. Mm. Uh, you are fortunate you got yesterday. I had to buy just this morning. Uh, sadly, I had to pay the 14.16 uh, for petrol while diesel has crossed uh, 15 or almost 15 for some oil marketing companies. Uh, like you rightly indicated, this is 
uh, a follow-up from MPA's directive yesterday that the price stabilization and recovery levy, which they had uh, gone down on earlier in the in the beginning of the the window, mm. uh, should be restored. It leaves you wondering what kind of consultation really had gone on. Mm. Uh, what kind of uh, numbers cranking had gone on for the MPA to arrive at uh, that earlier communicate that the stabilization levy uh, should be zeroed. But we are also quite mindful of the fact that uh, the global, I mean, developments are looking quite, you know, uh, dire. Right. Uh, we are aware, the NPA is aware of this. Uh, the city has equally been, I mean, quite poor relative to the dollar over the past uh, four pricing windows, uh, more than two months uh, in a row. And so any industry person, any person in, interested in uh, how consumers would fare, uh, would begin to want to implement measures uh, to, as it were, reduce the hardships uh, on people buying from the pump. So I am quite thinking that the NPA, being aware of these numbers, mm. uh, trying to also help uh, the consuming public would have made policy suggestions to uh, the finance ministry and for that matter, any other person that needed to be consulted to go down on one of the taxes, which is the stabilization levy. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, that levy has been the main source of funding for, uh, as it were, the premix that fishermen are currently using. So mm. it looks as though the fund has run out. Right. It looks as though they would need more money to pay for premix, for which reason uh, they would now come back to say that what we reversed on the 1st of April, on the 4th of April, uh, please restore and start charging in it. Uh, it's inconvenient for isn't, consumers, it's inconvenient. It, it, I mean, doesn't it public. make it so, so confusing that you, you take a decision today and after four days the decision is reversed? I mean, what happened to planning and being forthright with like the people? Like how was that? Like I was suggesting, our little engagements with the NPA, uh, you have people in there who would clearly want the public to get some good. Uh, I am certain in my mind, I haven't spoken with them yet, mm. uh, that they probably uh, being aware of you know price movements globally, again, how bad the city is faring, they would have made policy suggestions to government uh, to look at, I mean, going down on some of the taxes for which right. I am certain would have culminated in the earlier announcement for them to go down on the stabilization levy to zero. Uh, but I'm sure that government is also hard pressed for, for money. So government would return and say, look, if you don't charge that one, we won't find money for premium. So go back and collect it. The confusion uh, could have been averted. But I am quite certain if you read uh, what is happening today, uh, the, the Ukrainian drones are actually bombing Russian refineries. So they are knocking off a lot of the outputs, uh, the refined product output. What that will mean is that uh, this window, the next window, there will be a squeeze. People will have to pay more. Yes. The city is not even stable for you to say that uh, the city could help, I mean, ease up the pressure. So if the two continue to push, uh, I'm, I'm afraid. Poor prices will simply uh, go past the 15, 16 mark in no time. Because from, from, from what I'm reading, the instability in the Middle East and the, the issues that are happening between Israel and Iran now may push prices even further. I agree with you. And I'm sure the bits of information available to all of us, NPA would have had that information. NPA would have made policy suggestions or propositions to the government to say, look, the myriad of taxes on the petroleum price bill that the PBU, if you could go down on some of them, we can contain uh, these increments uh, looming or that are imminent. And I, suspect, and I suspect that that was the reason why the suspension came into effect on... Uh, Exa four, four, four exactly my thinking. Mm -hmm. Exactly my thinking. So when you wake up three, four days later, and then there's a, an overturn, it simply tells you that maybe government is, I mean, opposed to it completely and is insisting they should go back and collect the money. Otherwise, I do not see how MPA will shoot itself in the foot 
uh, the way this has, I mean, played out. But clearly, it could be coming out of, you know, some useful thinking, uh, some policy idea or suggestion uh, to authorities to consider so as to not overburden the consuming public. Because you have also reiterated, once these things are happening, I've had conversations with the driver uh, bodies from GPR to you to consent to committed to all of them. Mm. They are asking, is this going to be sustained? Should they increase transport fares? Right. So it has a certain cascading effect. I am sure these are the sort of things NPA would have tried to avert, but clearly, if the government doesn't have money, the government doesn't have money. They will have to come back and collect it. My, my, sadly, my, my, my final question will be: in, in an environment where your city is not doing so well, where global politics is, you know, pushing prices up. There appears to be no end in sight. If you are to advise government on the way forward to cushion the consuming public, what would that be? When levy that was supposed to bring some relief has now been reimposed on the consumer. You see, we have suggested this time with our number that you need a dual, dual pricing formula uh, should be considered. Mm. Now, considering dual pricing formula is to say that, look, in times when prices are favorable, uh, we could have the full stream of taxes, right? Mm. But in times when prices are so bad that if we allow the pumps to just adjust, uh, everybody will have to pay so much. Cost of living baselines will go up. Inflation, and I have repeated this time with our number that government is the single largest consumer in the, in the, in the economy. So once fuel goes up, Everybody that depends on government for fuel to be able to go about their, their normal day-to-day -day work would simply have to pay more, and that will hit government's expenditure uh, bottom. Mm. And so these increases, it would inconvenience the, the private person, uh, but, I mean, albeit for a short period. The government will have to find money to pay women uh, across board. Once that happens... Government expenditure will simply be thrown overboard. Mm. And so we are thinking that the earlier they consider a dual pricing formula, where when international market prices are so fatal or so bullish, we ease down the taxes a bit. When we can accommodate the taxes, then you can introduce and even add on so that prices are a bit balanced or stable. But as it stands, we are not looking at that. Centro came on stream not long ago. And already, Dumso has also knocked out Centro. So you yes. may have to go back to importing 100% yes. everything. There's, there's quite a bit of a challenge that we need to uh, find tentative solutions. But as to whether that is where we are or what we are doing, uh, your guess will be as good as mine. We are not looking for solutions. Quick fixes. That's all we're doing. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Duncan. I'm one the is uh, with the uh, petroleum uh, consumers. And those are his comments on this particular matter. But how is this impacting on your pockets? We spoke to some people in the streets of Accra. Uh, this one is very difficult because anytime there's an increment in fuel prices, we have to wait for our authorities to give us an, an order. But as at now, there has been no order. So we have nothing to say about it. And so the authorities give us order that maybe you should increase the fare or not. Other than that, there's no way we can increase it. That's what is going on. In fact, it is very bad. It is very bad. As I, as I now that I'm talking to you, drivers are suffering. There has been increased, they've increased everything in Ghana, but transport fares alone has gone down. We cannot afford it. We cannot afford the fuel prices. It is very difficult for us. So if the government would take a good look at what is going on, it would be far better for us because you can come to work, go home with an empty hand. We have families. We have, fam we have wives and children. A lot of drivers are crying, but it is very bad for us. That's what, what is going on. Um, I understand that we have global crisis economically. So we have to be careful the way we argue about issues of fuel increment and other commodities. Um, I don't want to sound political, but the issue is that there is untold hardship now. For people to even afford one meal a day is a challenge. I think we can all appreciate that. 
Uh, that notwithstanding, if you ask me, people in government need to actually be selective when it comes to increasing certain, uh, the price of certain commodities, especially fuel, which is very sensitive. You know, fuel is a determinant of the pricing in the country. And any attempt to actually hike it will holistically affect everything. You know, cars go to bring goods from um, the villages. And if fuel prices have been increased, definitely the cost will be transferred to the consumer. So much as we appreciate that there is a problem, like I stated earlier, uh, we should try as much as possible to also try to bring some subsidy. The fuel price they bring it, this is enough. We can't buy the fuel. Last time they said they bring the fair for us, but the fair didn't come out. You know, we can't buy the spare parts. We stop the cars for you. We can't, we can't buy anything. The spare parts is more than everything. So, you know, the fuel, only the fuel we buy it. Spare parts. Now, we can fair from 2016, we buy it to 4 million. Now, we 7 million to 8 million. We can't buy it. Now, we are. We are requesting the fuel. We are suffering. So they, they should do something for us. Okay. So one liter is now be uh, 70, uh, 70 cities for one liter. So we buy almost two million. You get two liters and small. Fuel, I hope say many. So again, the bigger issue is about the increments and the effect it will have on transportation especially. And Abbas Imo is the Industrial Relations Officer with the Ghana Private Road Transport Union. And he joins me here in the studio. Mr. Inusa, you're okay. welcome. Thank you, sir. I hope the Ramadan is, is treating you well. We are managing. <laughs> A few it's, days ago. It's a must. Yes, so few days ago. And I'm sure we'll come with a lot of blessings. We are finishing hard. Yes. We are finishing hard. So... Is it welcome news or news that you, you you dread? This can never be a welcome news because already we are restrained with the current fuel prices. Mm -hmm. We even came up and we draw an increment, like one of my colleagues said. Yes, we we are seriously, seriously being very careful, mm. we don't come up with an increment just to visit an increase in fuel the next day as we have just now. experienced. Mm. Because it takes time before we come up with an upward adjustment mm. in glory phase. We are aware the whole nation is up to us looking at what exactly we are going to come mm. up with. We most of the time also think about our clients who are our passengers. You know, it is our children, our relatives who join the vehicles. Mm. So most oftenly, we are being very careful before coming up with any upward adjustment. That is our business. Our business is currently declining. So we are working seriously to see what best we could come up with. And the recent issue has even justified whatever we will come up with. But because I know that in times past, we wanted to increase first. Yes. And then meetings upon meetings. We drew that. Yes. And now, these latest increments yeah. clearly put you in a position where you will say that, no, we cannot continue to charge the existing fee and that there's a need for us to adjust our fares. Is that, have you started discussing that? Yes. Uh, today, uh, our leadership as I arranged for a meeting next week. Mm. So God willing, God willing, next week, 
will definitely come up with something. Mm. We initially came up with something. Transport ministry throwing the towel that would, we know they also defend our clients and, and they are pleading we can't go solo, mm. going on our own. And we agreed to that. We gave them that respect. We sat, I think, twice, and there was a hold up of which our leadership has signaled all of us today that God willing, next week, Wednesday, we'll be having a meeting on this current issue. So, so, so this meeting that is coming up on Wednesday is to decide whether to increase price, increase first, and by how much? It's, it's to see to ourselves how to, if there is a need of readjusting what we already have in the bucket mm. or adding something to it or otherwise before finally uh, sitting with the uh, transport ministry and we blow up whatever we have in the bucket meaning wh wh whatever decision you will come to you you it will have to be such that you agree with the transport ministry or the coordinating uh, council normally no no we are not under the coordinating council they, they, they've always been part of they, they, of this they, process they sing their song and if you listen to the song, there's no trouble in it. Mm. And even the bass is distorted. <laughs> we, are no, we are autonomous. Uh -huh. Undisputedly, everybody, they themselves know no. that the leading private transport operators in the country. We operate everywhere. Mm. Even places without names, we even give places names. Mm. We know it. And what we are saying is, whatever decision we arrive at, and the transport ministry are also there to defend the... Uh, the government the and the public. The yes, The public, yeah. Mm. So we most often sit with them, argue on whatever decision we have taken. Yes, insurance premium was here. It has gone up by this margin. You know, we don't run transport with only fuel. Mm. But fuel plays most important... The claim is that it, yes. it plays about 30% of yes. the operational cost. I will even give it 40%. 40%. And give the rest, the other... We have documentation of insurance premium... Spare pass. This uh, permits, etc., etc. We have lubricant spare pass also mm. playing its role. So we have to visit all these issues and put it in one basket. This is what we've been doing. But, so mm -hmm. when we are up with things that we, we can defend anywhere, like we are here, mm. yes, if we have come up with a percentage of upward adjustment, I should be in a very good position to defend whatever decisions you ask me. You mm. tell your people my advice is double B. <laughs> one. We'll do that. One is. We'll do that. Okay. Mm. So this is what we do. So when is the God willing, our leadership has some us for a meeting of which, of course, we are going to, like you build a house, the final touches, then we will revisit the transport ministry. But are your members complaining? Is, they, it, is it impacting on they, your operations? They are complaining. The fact that they are working means they are also making sales. They are making sales. They are, making uh, sales. They, they are still making sales. If I say they, we are complaining. Mm -hmm. We are all complaining all the time. But you see, we have a laid down regulation of which we want to abide by mm -hmm. that indicating we are always law-abiding citizens. Mm. We don't do right. things haphazardly. All right. That is the Alaji, I'll come back to you to wrap up on this matter. But let me just uh, quickly bring in uh, Professor uh, Godfrey Bobkin with the University of Ghana Business School. Prof, it's a pleasure to have you here on the pause. Now, I mean, yesterday was another matter. Today is another matter. There appears to be no end inside in, in terms of the way the economy is hitting us. Fuel clearly drives everything, drives the economy. I mean, can the government do something about this? Long ago. Um, there are so many things not going in our favor. Um, government made some attempts a couple of weeks ago, also including the removal of the stabilization service. Mm. But the government changed its mind. I think that two and a half years ago, it was very clear to us that the government needed to take certain drastic measures, especially on wasteful expenditure cuts. Failure to do so, it was going to be difficult to have the fiscal space 
to grant some relief to Ghanaians without compromising the macro uh, uh, gains that you have made. That is, these are the difficult choices the government is confronted with. So it, it, it is not coming to me as a surprise that the government is, is reversing some of those decisions. And, and we should also just bear in mind that um, the honeymoon of the IMF program is over. And therefore, the reality is coming to, 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 to bear. And, 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 and if, you, if you look at the data from Bank of Ghana, even from the composite index of economic activity, from business confidence index, consumer confidence index, and all of that, you realize that they, we, we haven't seen any significant improvement. Mm. And then also, if you see the rate of uh, the decline in inflation that we witnessed, especially in the second half of 2023, you can see that that case has slowed completely. Right. And now hovering around 23% and all of that. And then also, if you look at the latest uh, monetary policy committee press release, you will see that one of the reasons why the, the, the monetary policy committee of Bank of Ghana decided to keep the rate at 29% was to make reference to, to the possibility of the petroleum price going up, export price going up. Mm. Okay. And because the pass-through is, is, is real and is contemporaneous to some extent, right? Of course, some transmission lag, you can see that uh, if you do the modeling. And then also if you see the exchange rate uh, depreciation, it passed through. Of course, there's some transmission lag, but of course, you can also see it effect and all of that. So, yes, we've made some progress, but we, there's still a lot that we have to do. Uh, going forward. If you look at the 2023 GDP decomposition, mm. you can see that industrial activity really has slowed and all of that. So really, we are not adding value to our pr primary products in order to command margins. Okay, and even the, the sub-sectors that drove growth in 2023, they were not intensive sub-sectors of the economy to drive the necessary job creation and employment that one would have, would have wished. Right, and, and I've just been asking myself and some of my guests that came on early on about why government will, will, will institute a program to say that we are suspending the levies and then four days later, there's another communication that says that no, the levies should go back. And I look at some of the IMF timelines and it says that the expenditure savings, which are also critical to create the needed fiscal space, will stem from efficient gains and a reduction of the large subsidy bill to the energy sector. Is it the case that we forgot that we are, we are under an IMF program and then suddenly realize that, I, no, I, we need to ensure that we stay within uh, their limits? Yeah, I think um, it's also an admission that the government admits the level of pressure and, and they would have wished to do something about it. That's why I say that um, the real stuff that government needed to do, they failed to do that. If you look at the IMF supported program, expenditure rationalization of restraints is only contributing uh, uh, just about 40% to the fiscal savings under the IMF supported program, mm. whilst it is heavily based on revenue and taxes and taxes. But once you, you have that approach, you, you, it's very difficult then to have the necessary fiscal space to maneuver in, in, in difficult times. Mm. Okay. And, and that is where they find themselves. But could there be a way out? We have soaring fuel prices on the energy sector there's so much uncertainty i mean mm. i mean i i have, i'm living is in the state where i have conditioned myself to to the point where my light can go off and i wouldn't know when it will come back and that creates a lot of issues in the system yeah i mean i think that you know um, you don't need to be an economist or um uh, objective to see what is going on this is an election year and, and yet, we have all this um, doom saw and all of that going on. If there's really anything that government <laughs> would want to do, perhaps, then time is not on their side. Mm. But I think that we should just um, brace ourselves up for more challenges ahead. Um, of course, we know that the worst case scenario, we have crossed that, but we are not out of the way. There are challenges ahead. Uh, unfortunately, as, as I indicated earlier, the, the hardcore things that government needed to do
to free up space in order to pass on some relief to Ghanaians. The, the, the president is not willing to do that. Government is not willing to do that. Mm. Once you're not willing to do that, it's going to be difficult. So let's, it, it looks as though let's muddle through. Remember that beyond the IMF supported program, we are not doing anything of our own to complement the gains from there. And the IMF managing director, the president himself had told us that it will, it will take something more than the IMF supported program for us to get out of this. But the question is, what is it that we are doing on our own to complement the limited gains from the IMF supported program? We need to demonstrate that. I think we need to inspire hope. And I think the president needs to come to terms with the reality that, yes, um, he has just a few months and, 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 and things are not going well. The, the level of recovery, remember just a couple of months ago, we were singing, turning the corner, yes. and turning the corner, and turning the corner. Uh, what has happened to that song? Who took it away from our lips? We need to do a lot more to sustain that turnaround story. So the evidence on the ground right now mm -hmm. is, is contrary. So, so, so therefore, better days are very far away from us. Well, I, I think we have said before that if we are looking at real improvement, in the lives of the ordinary Ghanaian, we are talking about greater economic transformation and increasing productivity growth. This is, we, we can't expect that within a, a three year IMF supported program. No, that's not possible. That's right. not possible. That well, would be as difficult as action things to climb a tree. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> a, a long time away from us. Professor Goffred Bobkin, thank you very much for your time this afternoon here on the pause. I'll you, let me wrap up with you here. So we are all looking forward to this Wednesday meeting. I asked you earlier about the frustration or the challenges your members are going to, whether they are able to keep their heads no, above no, water. Don't exclude me. We are going okay. through. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a professional driver. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yes, it's true. And we we'll just played with them. It's like seeing a driver in the vehicle. You just see the head, the hands, mm -hmm. them, but you don't know what is going on under. Yes, that is exactly when the short period that they were not hearing of us, we were accelerating the launch and as normal as a normal driver should do. Mm. So, God willing, I strongly believe we will come out with a sound percentage of which our members will embrace. The passengers should not blame anybody as such. So, until the Wednesday meeting and then the, the formal communication, nobody should increase first? For now, no, not at all. We should manage and uh, we, now, if you increase it and you come up with about 10% and we decide to come at above, that, that uh, what are you going to do? Mm. You are going to create enmity between you and your clients. You'll be fighting yourselves. And if you decide to come up with something and the public says, no, we are not privy to that, it's going to create another problem. So we we'll played with our membership or the entire professional driving society to exercise patients so that we look at the other side of the coin and come up with something better which will benefit all of us and Th we'll move on with thank you so much that meeting is this week wednesday, wednesday god willing uh, yes yeah. that is the the gprt position so even though price of petroleum products uh, they, they've gone up it doesn't provide any justification for any increment for on transport fares at least for now you have to wait till Wednesday when they will hold their meeting and then announce whether they're going to increase or they're going to keep prices the way they are. This is the pause. <laughs> we, we, we have to come out with <laughs> upward adjustment. All right. This is the pause here on Join. We'll take a short break. We shall be back with more stories. Welcome back to the polls here on Joy News. Let's move to some other stories now, and very interesting one, of course. Selection of finalists of this year's Joy News Impact Makers Awards has begun. Now, 10 individuals out of over 200 entries will be announced in a couple of days for national recognition for the various impactful projects they have embarked on in their communities. This is the second edition of the awards scheme instituted by Joy News to celebrate ordinary people making extraordinary impasse, but have not received any form of recognition or support. This year's event is slated for the 17th of May at the Labadi Beach Hotel in Accra. If you are anxious about the status of your nomination, the awards team says you need to relax. The finalists will be announced in the coming days on this 
platform and all other joy brands platforms for your information. And if you have not filed your nomination yet, be informed that this year's entries has been closed. You should look forward to next year to file your impact makers nominee. So what's more, project lead MFA Atiamo early joins me in the studio for a brief conversation. So MFA, this 10 people, I'm interested in knowing what they did to <laughs> merit the position. <laughs> they did a lot. Mm. They did a lot. So it covers areas like education, okay. health, agri, ICT. And these are people who one way or the other have realized the need for any form of service in these areas that I've mentioned. Okay. If it's education, maybe there is the lack of an infrastructure or furniture something mm. and that individual or group of individuals have taken it upon themselves to make provision for children so that they are not left out okay. they don't lag behind mm -hmm. and then same applies to health um, the communities are many government is unable to meet everyone's need right so you have individuals who are making several interventions be it buildings mm -hmm. be it building equi uh, sorry health equipment tools okay even People are volunteering to provide services, healthcare services. All of these people, we are singling them out for recognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so 10 out of 200 entries. Yes, over 200. I can imagine the work that went into deciding Very, very fortunately, with the help of the criteria we have designed mm -hmm. for the award scheme, we are able to know who should go above the other. And so there is an issue of re replicability of the project mm -hmm. that an individual might have been nominated for. Sure. There's also the issue of the, the far-reaching nature of the impact that the individual is engaged in. Mm -hmm. You also want to look at the ingenuity of the project. Mm -hmm. Is it the everyday thing that somebody is doing that you are also copying? Or this one, you are being very original about it. And right. so it's new. Mm -hmm. It is something that everyone can latch on and say, oh, this, if the person is given a bigger support, the, the impact may do better. May mm -hmm. do better. Mm -hmm. And then we are also looking at um, um, how, how innovative or how sustainable the project is. Sometimes, yes, you might be engaged in one form of campaign or the other, maybe a month to some couple of days, then it's over. But we are asking this project that you're engaging, how long uh, would it be? Okay. Is it, would it last? Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, and how many, and, and the longer the project stays, the, the, the bigger the impact. Right. So this is the criteria we are using to enable us to select the finalists. So, so the 10, out of the 10, we're going to have an eventual winner. Yes, so there'll be an overall winner, mm -hmm. but all the 10 will, uh, receive, winners. Yes, will, be, will, be, mm -hmm. will be winners in the various areas or sectors they've been entered in for this award. So when our nomination is closed? Yes, for now, no at nomination least until is next year. Yes, mm -hmm. we are preparing for the award scheme. Mm -hmm. So we are using this period till the 17th of May. Uh, before, just have, uh, two weeks to the event, we'll mm -hmm. announce the winners, the finalists, just mm -hmm. for them to know and also to prepare. Uh, so as we speak, the, the 200 entries, nobody knows. No, 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 you, no. You've, no. Selected on, you, you've settled on the 10. But you are yet no, to no, no, the 10, that. we are still working on the 10. We are right. not done with it. All right, we, I get it's, it it's in the process. So mm -hmm. there's a team of judges, okay, that's working on the final 10. Okay. But at over 200, we have sifted it down. We mm -hmm. have we've been able to sort, select, I mean, using the criteria I spoke about okay. to be able to scale the number down to make it easier for the judges to uh, do their work. And the final event is on the 17th It's of on May. the 17th of next month, mm -hmm. May 2024, at the Labadi Beach Hotel. Mm -hmm. The question is, how impactful is impact makers making on the society that we live that, in? That brings me to the experience of last year exactly. and those who received awards. Their story is endless. I have people who have had the opportunity of having to register organizations, foundations, institutions as a result of our recognition of their efforts last year. That's where you go to know. Exactly. And there are, there's this gentleman I would mention, Mr. Okomensa. Mm -hmm. He was into beekeeping. With the help of Joy News Impact Makers Awards, he's been able to secure funding on three different occasions to be able to train over 200 young people beekeeping. in beekeeping before he was not That's able really to do that. Impact. Yes, yes. And there's this other gentleman in the, in the upper, upper West region, Baba Ilyasu. Mm. He was into caring for people with mental illness mm. uh, before he would go out of his own 
resources take something to be able to provide for medication feeding upkeep and it was a lot on him yes. but with the help of impact makers he said he's not been able to register the foundation wow. and every day he's getting donations he's getting support he's been invited to do so many programs here and there all because of that exposure impact, right. Um, we spoke to Yaira a, a number of days ago on AM show. She was telling us about the support she's been giving school children across the country mm -hmm. in remote areas. Normally, she would go and support them with learning materials, reading books, you know, pen, those things they need in school mm -hmm. to be able to carry out their academic activities. With the support of the Joy News Impact Makers, she's getting more and more support to be able to reach out to these children who would have otherwise not gotten the needed support. Right. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's how far reaching the impact. And, and are we getting any been. support for the second edition? Absolutely, we are. Fortunately, we are having DBS company on board. Mm -hmm. We are also having Magdan on board and uh, some other companies. But the point is we need more. We wish we could celebrate more people, mm -hmm. you know, for now, we are celebrating 10 people. We are looking towards to a time where we will be able to celebrate 20, 50, 30. In various categories. In various categories, mm -hmm. as much as possible. Because really, then that is when uh, we are really impacting. We are giving more people the opportunity, the platform, the room, to be able to expand on the impact they are making. Mm -hmm. And we can only do that with the support of Corporate Ghana. We can only do that with the support of institutions who identify with what we are doing. We are asking that they shouldn't hesitate in reaching out to us. Again, that to the, make this possible. The time is 17th May. It's 17th for the May. It's 17th and the May. the venue? Yes, and the venue is at the Labadi Beach Hotel. And I just want to say again, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are calling and they are asking because uh, they've gotten information or somebody has told them, I've nominated you right. for this, for this, and they, they want to know. They've not heard anything. We are telling them that they should remain calm. Right. In the next couple of days, we'll be announcing the finalists. And then you would know if you made it away, uh, for the 10 finalists. But point is, even if you didn't make it, and Relax. That impact recognize exactly. Enough. Exactly. Yeah. Impact makers has come to stay. So if you don't get it this year, you can always try next year and the subsequent years. You will certainly get a slot. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very soon. Thank you. Emifa Ali is lead project for our impact makers uh, initiative. Now to some other stories and the registrar of the scholarship secretary, Dr. Kingsley Ajeman, is advocating for swift legislation to streamline the distribution of scholarship in the country in order to cure numerous misconceptions. He highlights the current challenge faced by officers in making decisions due to the absence of a clear legislation defining who qualifies as a needy individual for scholarship. Dr. Ajiman's stance comes in response to a recent publication by the fourth estate alleging, among others, that scholarships are being unfairly distributed to well-connected affluent individuals. In an interview, in an upcoming interview with my colleague, Carlos Caloni, Dr. Ajiman emphasizes the necessity of legislation to dispel any misconception about eligibility criteria. For the past seven years, he has led the Ghana Scholarship Secretariat overseeing significant transformations, such as the digitization of application processes. However, amid these successes, there have also been notable allegations regarding his leadership including claims of selling scholarships to party affiliates at the expense of deserving candidates and report of delays in stipend payment for foreign students. We'll delve deeper into these allegations. Additionally, my guest is vying to represent the constituent of Ibuakwa South as a member of parliament uh, under the New Patriotic Party, the NPP ticket in the upcoming elections will explore his plans for the constituency if elected. Joining me for the next 30 minutes is Dr. Kingsley Ajiman. Hello. Hi, Carlos. Right, so uh, before we even go deeper into these issues, we would want to uh, know who Dr. Kingsley Ajiman is. Thank you very much and um, happy Easter to all, all your cherished viewers. Dr. Kingsley Ajiman is a Ghanaian. I come from the Ebuakwa South constituency. I had most of my schooling here in Ghana, mm. a few top ups abroad. I've worked, though I used to work in the financial services industry, rising up to become a managing director of the defunct Unique Life Insurance Company Limited. Okay. Got into the heli belly of Ghanaian politics in 2015, contest, contested for parliamentary primaries, lost, didn't give up, 
and began my journey out front. And by, by the kind courtesy of my constituents, they gave me an overwhelming victory in the just past uh, parliamentary primaries, mm -hmm. sweeping almost 95 point something percent of total vote cast. Represents a very huge percentage in the annals of parliamentary primaries when it comes to the MPP in Ghana. So this is the journey. Built career in the financial services industry. Academia, build strong or building strong fundamentals within academia. PhD in public health and health promotion, a specific research area in obesity wow. and a lifestyle. Sit on several academic boards and visiting fellow in uh, universities abroad and locally. Great, rich background. And so we can comfortably say that one of your legs is already in parliament, knowing that, I mean, this is uh, the stronghold of the NPP. We'll come to that aspect, but you have been at the helm of affairs at the uh, scholarship secretariat for the past seven years. Tell us um, what states you met the secretariat when you first went there. <laughs> seven years of, you know, very, very, very uneven trajectory. Mm. A very huge facility, if all intent and purposes, established to build the human capacity of our country since 1960. So it is, it is absolutely right to put in perspective that I'm not the first manager of the scholarship secretary. It's been in existence since 20, 1960. Mm -hmm. Walking into the corridors of the Ghana School of Secretariat, any time I try to revisit the, f the first day, it gives me goose pimples. This was a national uh, edifice that was neglected, abandoned, and forgotten. I remember very well, it was a Friday. I didn't even know where it was till I picked up my appointment at Jubilee. I asked for direction, they, act, they directed me there. And the weekend leading to the Monday for the start of work, was a very difficult journey for me. A deserted, a deserted place, about two computers, one printer, no suitable furniture to set. I mean, the place was not celebrous for any, any, any proper or meaningful work as, been, as it ought to be. Okay. I mean, one would have expected that getting into a place where we, go, we, we are supposed to be training the the skill set of the country, at least basic expectations like an, inter an, an interactive website, well sit a star, well focused with proper attitude, an office that when you enter, you know that this is a place that is meant for business. I mean, it was an illusion. Mm -hmm. So we, we, needed to, we needed to quickly work on our internal processes. Okay. Internal processes, I mean, that, you know, branding is very key and they're having a very congenial, atmosphere, especially <laughs> toiletries. Oh. There were no toilets around. When it's the time of the month, women have to walk around to see if they can find a, a very suitable office nearby to clean up. The gentlemen were just standing up there outside there to, you know, uh, free themselves, kind of. So it was a very deserted place, so we needed to quickly work on. By the time I took over, the budget for 2017 had been read, and even the media budget had been read. So there was no way you could even ask for additional funding or funding. So I had to resort to corporate Ghana. Mm. I remember uh, we, were, we were the managers of the, we were the managers of the then uh, Northern, Northern scholarships, where you know people of the Northern extraction, uh, we had a free, free, some form of free high exactly. school. And uh, the first point was, ah, why, do, why would we write checks for all these over 100 uh, institutions in the northern regions? And the southern part had what we call the hardship scholarship. So almost all the secondary schools were eligible mm. at the time. So why were we writing checks for people to come and pick it up? So we write a check for scholarship grant or feeding grant mm. for Paga Secondary School or so. They have to travel all the way down south to come and, to come and pick it up. So I said, no, we have to do some banking. Okay as a way of trying to get the banking sector to support us. So we issued a directive which was resisted vehemently by Charles, the, then, uh, the Charles of the then uh, three northern, northern regions. Okay. They resisted it. I couldn't understand why you don't want to be paid through 
a banking system. They wanted to have the check. The, to check. Yeah. the reasons later I found out was very funny, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it represents the Ghanaian kind of. Okay. So we needed to appeal to corporate Ghana. They, they began supporting us. We went to give her for computers. The chief of staff also supported us, and we began building a place. So for the past, for the, for, for the first six months or so, we needed to build internal capacity. Now you have computers. Mm. These are staff, I mean, without, without you know, disrespecting anybody, these are staff, some have worked there as high as 33 years, 20 years, average age of work there range was about 15 years. Okay. Very comfortable with their manual ways of doing okay. things. So now you want to replace your computers, that. culture. Anybody that wants to discuss leadership and rule out the variable called culture will not be doing a very good service to academia mm. and even practical world. So we need to change the culture. Okay. Another aspect was a typical public place that was deserted. Attitudes were off. Mm. It was very usual for them to start, come to work at 10 and close at 3 because there was nothing much happening at the, at the place. So I did what I call leadership by example. Mm. When I was about 3 that I found those who are likely to be leaving, I go to them, begin to have discussions about their work what we can do to improve the work and stuff like that. So over time, they imbibed the, into the, the culture into it. And the culture and, uh, We were closing as late as 10 p.m. And by 7 a.m. the following day, we were, we, were, we were around. So we began changing the narratives. Now you have, to, uh, you have to introduce the computers to them by training them on basic Microsoft Office. Okay. So a tax that will usually take them their manual way of about, let's say, an hour. Mm. This time was taking about a week or two. But you have to be, you have to be very patient because you, are, you, you, you started with the end in mind. All right. You started with the notion that uh, people drive value and that we are going to run a system which the people must own. Okay. Any attempt to impose on them will mean that they will resist it. And you will not be able to. Okay. So, 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 so basically, you introduced some reforms. A lot of, a lot of reforms. Okay. So, for the past seven years, having introduced these reforms, how would you say um, administration of scholarships have actually fared under your leadership under the last seven years, for instance? It, it's been very great. I mean, for us to be having this discussion means that we are now more proactive than reactive as we we met it. Okay. I mean, back in the days, you only heard of scholarship secretariat when students were abandoned. There was a lot of, you know, things that were not being done properly. But now, or even before COVID, we were most of the time out there mm. portraying what we do, any good thing that was happening. That was the agenda, to be able to be very visible and, you know, propagate or let the public know what was happening. Mm. So uh, there's, there's, been, there's been a lot, there's been a lot of improvement. The attractions that we have had over the years, which for me is a very good problem to have. It means that the Ghanaian youth is very desirous of, you know, having a skill development. And for you to flip something, you have about 8,000, 7,000, 5,000 people applying or expressing interest. an interest. It means that there's some form of confidence in you and people, who people want to try to see if they can also have the opportunity. Okay, so for purposes of clarity, where you saw the secretariat, the reforms you introduced seven years you're saying you've seen some improvement so uh, for instance before you met or you went to the secretariat uh, averagely per annum how many uh, scholarships were we giving out okay. and we didn't so, up to now let, let's see the numbers so let, let's try and put it in perspective i mean we need to compare because exactly. i represent a government so maybe between 2012 i'll say that between 2012 and 2016 mm. for local scholarships mm. that's under the ndc government they awarded 27,163. Okay. Whereas between 2017 and 2021, we have awarded 124,960. For foreign scholarships, between 2012 and 2016, NDC awarded 2,876. Whereas between 2017 and 2021, we have awarded 7,423. So, what caused this huge jump? Was it a funding issue? What was it? Uh, it's a multiplicity of uh, Factors. Okay. Funding very key, but positioning yourself for traction that comes in the form of the bilateral scholarships is also a very dominant variable that you can downplay. And 
internal processes to restructure the flow of work. Mm. Right, so that's the executive uh, director of the scholarship secretary, Dr. Kingsley. I will bring you the entire interview in subsequent bulletins. But this is the pause here on Joy News. We'll take a short break. When we return, we have America Decides. This is America Decides. My name is Eche Sikanku. This is where we take a bite at what is happening on the international stage, but specifically in the USA, where there is a very, very heated ongoing campaign uh, for the next presidency. And of course, we do know uh, how impactful this is for the country and for the rest of the world as well. So this afternoon, we put the spotlight on two towering figures in American politics. They've dominated the headlines and dominated the narratives. Former President Donald Trump and incumbent President Joe Biden. Over the past week, we've looked at some of the issues have been, that have been dominating the race. But today, we delve into the personalities that are at the center of this race. As the nation braces for another momentous election, questions abound. Debates are ravaging and discussions are unending. Key among them, the various issues that are being discussed, is the question of if former President Donald Trump can stage a comeback after his tumultuous term. That saw him losing to Joe Biden, the former vice president of Barack Obama, who eventually made it to the White House and the most powerful seat in the nation and the world. However, Biden's presidency has weathered a lot of storms. There have been a lot of criticisms and many challenges. Key among them is his age and his cognitive and mental abilities. We will be seeking answers to these questions from a political scientist shortly uh, before we even go way deeper into this. But for the starters, we are going to have a roundup of a key uh, amount of issues, key events that have occurred this week in the American political arena. It's much set and go. But before then, let's look at the data. Well, at present, data from the Federal Electoral Commission indicates that the Biden campaign has more money to spend than Donald Trump's. And if you follow the politics there, money is essential, money is key, money determines who is able to travel across the expanse of the country, who is able to bombard the airwaves with advertisements, and who is able to do a lot more grassroots engagements. And this revelation has come up very recently following a mega fundraising event organized by the Democratic presidential campaign which, I mean, it's nothing we've, we've, we've ever seen, we, something we've never seen before. It headlined two former presidents and a current president. That's three against one. Former President Bill Clinton, former President Barack Obama, and incumbent President Joe Biden. That's a lot of star power on the campaign trail, coming together to combine their resources and their celebrity status to raise money for the Democratic campaign and for Joe Biden. According to the, the Biden campaign, the star-studded event raked in as much as about $25 million. By any measure, a record-breaking figure. In this sense, the New York City-based program or fundraiser has come at, as a huge boost for President Biden. And he needs it very, very badly. Why? Because he's going against a former President Donald Trump who is the master tactician of getting coverage at the, snap, at the snap of a finger. Very dramatic in every sense of the word. 
Biden needs those numbers. He needs those figures. Donald Trump has successfully posted the $175 million bond he was ordered to pay by a court as condition for his appeal. Remember, this was the big issue, the big challenge in the Trump campaign. He was taken to that civil um, case where he was found guilty of overpricing some of his estates, found guilty, ordered to post bond, about $454 million. He went on and said he wasn't getting the money, appealed, they lowered the money, and he's finally been able to pay it. That in itself is a different conversation because people are saying that demonstrates that there are two different justice systems for a white candidate, for black candidates. But that's a matter for another day. The settlement has warded of any attempt by the New York Attorney General's office to seize Trump's assets in order to defray his legal debt. So if this wasn't done, <laughs> the Attorney General's office would have begun seizing some of Donald Trump's property, which in itself, in and of itself, would be a huge embarrassment to somebody who has built his political and personal identity around wealth, profits, and business. The Trump lawyers complained, and this was reduced and he's finally posted it. So this is where we are in terms of the race, this is where we are in terms of the roundup. But it's also a very good opportunity to take a, an in-depth look at the profiles of President, or former President Donald Trump and incumbent President Joe Biden. Who are these personalities? I mean, there's a lot that has been said um, concerning them. But we are going to really go into the details and look at, I mean, look at the slides and see um, what the two personalities look like in further detail. We've already established that is the quadrennial presidential election coming up in a couple of months, the 60th in the race. Um, so that's the basis for it next. Now, who are those personalities? Okay, let's move to the next slide. Joe Biden is on the seat at this present moment. Okay, so this is 101, all right? President Joe Biden, incumbent president, He's the nominee for, for the Democratic Party, okay, the Democrats, as they say. And the other dominant figure, Donald Trump. As we see, he's the presumptive presidential nominee, only because he has, in all practical purposes, won the presidential primaries. Although there are just some procedural things that are going on. So these are the two dominant ones. But it will interest you to know that we have other parties in the U.S. And that's, that's one question that we get a lot. You know, because most people are familiar with the two dominant parties, but there are other political parties that always contest in these elections. And independent candidates, of course. So in this particular election, Robert Kennedy Jr., and of course you remember the Kennedy name, which is a very popular one in American politics, um, if we go back to the previous slide, he is an anti-vaccine activist, which means that and while the rest of us were campaigning and mooting for vaccines as a way to prevent and stop the COVID-19 virus, he was staunchly against it for also all manner of reasons. So that's Robert Kennedy Jr. Um, coming off from the democratic tradition, right? So the question that many people are asking is that, is he going to siphon a lot of votes? Because he traditionally belongs to the Democratic Party. Okay? He traditionally belongs to the Democratic Party, but he, he, he has broken off in a way. So it's, it's a major deal because if most people decide that they are, not, they are not comfortable with Joe Biden, they might go for him. And this really would affect Biden's votes. And there are a lot of people like that. It's like those who are disenchanted by the ongoing... Um, the ongoing conflict in, 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 the, in, in Israel, between Israel and Palestine. Then there's Cornel West, smart, top-notch scholar and academic, former professor at big universities, Harvard, other places, right? Associated with Princeton as well. He's a political activist, Cornel West, African-American, 
also running as an independent. And we, had, we have a physician, Jill Stein, not so popular, but she has also put out her name there to run for the presidency. When we come back to the main candidates, how do they fare in the last election? So that's Joe Biden in 2020, having 51.3% of the votes, and former President Donald Trump, he got 46.8% of the vote. So that's quite a margin. So for all the election deniers or those who still have doubts about the election, well, these are the official results. And it's been proved to all intents and purposes that the elections were as credible as possible and verifiable. But Donald Trump is building his campaign on the fact that he was cheated in the election. So he, that's, what, that's what brings about the whole election denier thing. They say they cheated for Joe Biden. And they are still in that stage of denial. And it's a big issue. And some people believe him, by the way. But this, this is what the facts are. Okay. So we'll move on. After looking at both candidates, let's move on to the next slide. Delving into deeper. So, so actually, this would be the last. Um, this would be the last, I beg your pardon, um, talking about the major candidates in the election. So I think that brings us up to speed. That brings us up to speed uh, with the major candidates as far as the upcoming contest is concerned. Well, but let's do more than that. We are going to be going uh, to Zoom to have an interview and joining me now to dissect the various strategies, the strengths, weaknesses, and any potential stumbling blocks um, as far as the contenders are concerned is political scientist Dr. Kwesi Amachi Boateng, uh, who has very kindly joined us this evening. Um, thank you very much, Doc, for joining us. It's a great pleasure to have you. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon, Doc. Can you hear us, please? Yes, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Great pleasure to have you. How are you doing, sir? Uh, by God's grace, I'm good. Okay, we thank God. So, um, a number of questions that most people, I mean, not just in the U.S., but across the world, I mean, try to contend with. And the first is, um, given Donald Trump's popularity, right, um, a lot of people do know that he has very, very emotionally attached uh, supporters. And so, looking at that kind of popularity, but, but then we also know that he's facing a lot of legal hurdles. So there's been a lot of concern about why he's still popular, but do you actually think he, he, he could make um, a huge impact or he could actually win the upcoming elections? Why, why is he so popular? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Actually, it's an interesting thing. Uh, he's a fine matter of fact person. He addresses issues as he sees them, you know, call things by their names and straightforward. I don't know whether that uh, way of doing things of his is what I said, if you like, won him the support that he has, uh, especially, you know, from uh, the conservatives, um, the Republicans, uh, white communities, and then even some, you know, the Americans like to use the expression colored people. He's got, he's got support from, you know, across the United States. But I think, I think my personal understanding is that um, it's not difficult to even like um, uh, sort of uh, understand him or even to predict what he's going to do. He, 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 he's straightforward. I like to believe that that straightforward approach to issues, you know, uh, happens to strike a call on issues of immigration. I mean, people know where he stands. Um, issues of trade, American interest, uh, American relationship with other countries. He doesn't believe that Americans should sacrifice so much. And so he, he goes into those issues that ordinarily one would want to refer to as controversial, and he addresses them in a frank, matter of fact way. I like to believe that this has won him the support that he has. Um, that's very true. Um, actually, stopping his own party in the legislature from passing a compromised, I mean, a, a legislative bill on immigration, which both parties, including the Republicans, had even agreed to. He, he said they shouldn't pass it because it would be a victory for, 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 for Joe Biden. So I do agree that he actually fits into those hot-button issues. 
Um, what about President Joe Biden? He's, he's, he's navigating such a huge complex maze of um, domestic issues. Even in the country, there's the economy, there's international relations, which is very big. A lot of the young people are very mad at him about his continued and rapid support for Israel. Um, how do you assess his chances of maintaining the seat for the Democratic Party? Actually, he came into office with a huge popularity uh, coming on the heels of uh, Donald Trump. That I mean, uh, Donald Trump in office, uh, getting to the end of his term in office, if you like, he you know came off as a is it the show? Uh, a, a rush a rush individual, and that he had a, a potential to if you like lead America into some difficulties, and again the economy wasn't doing so well. Eventually, Joe Biden comes in huge popularity. His challenge is essential, the economy. Although uh, some people uh, sort of uh, challenge the arguments made concerning inflation and then um, the value of the currency domestically, yeah. they are challenged. Yet the polls indicate that you know that is what is on the mind of you know many uh, people who 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 were. Uh, or who took part in, in, in the polls that have been coming out. Again, Joe Biden's main challenge appears also to be his health, you know, and, and it has become a major issue. Uh, he, has, he, has, he has stumbled on a few occasions publicly. Uh, he fumbled on several occasions publicly, trying to get his words out. And so people are really not very sure that he has what it takes health-wise to lead the United States, if you like, a, a major power of the world. And that is, or well, that has the potential even to affect many of his uh, supporters. So his major challenge, immigration, uh, the rush to get into the United States, you know, at the southern border, Many people from many countries in South America, I mean, a human train, all moving towards the United States. You know, Trump took a, a very firm, specific, you know, a position on that and simply hit hard. You know, Trump pleased many people. He continues to please them now on that particular issue. It is a challenge for Joe uh, Biden, immigration to the economy, and then currently, even the, 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 the unflinching support for Israel. Right. You know, the unflinching support for Israel is, is right. turning no. negative. Initially, when it started, you know, everybody saw it as the right thing to do. The support for Israel has been normal. But then, with time, they felt that no, their own values, uh, human rights issues, hospitals sure. being bombed. Right. Okay. Right. So, 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 sorry to interrupt you, but um, I believe you were trying to say that um, that issue, um, that kind of support has now um, kind of reduced over time uh, because it goes against their values. Um, sorry to cut you in there, um, but we were wanting to wrap up with it, and so I just wanted to make sure that I got that point right before we wrap, wrap up with the show. Yes, so apologies for the interruption, but uh, um, Doc was trying to explain to us those issues that would potentially... Uh, be a stumbling block for uh, Joe Biden. And earlier on, he also told us about um, 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 Donald Trump. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us on this show today. Thank you to our guests as well uh, for joining us on this program. Our, our program will come to an end today. Hopefully, uh, you would make time to join us again uh, next week. My name is Echezi Kanku, and this has been America Decides. Mm -hmm.